engage, how you can engage missionally here and beyond that would fit your context as a congregation. That's sort of how I would describe my job, asking good questions so that you, as your own experts, can provide your own solutions in a sense. Oftentimes, we have the solutions right there in front of us. So that's a little bit about what I do. Um, I'm just going to read what Resonate Global Mission says is their vision, just to kind of give you an idea. Sometimes it's usually in front of me on my desk every, every day. Our vision is communities of disciples joining in God's mission as they faithfully proclaim and live out the good news of Jesus in their local neighborhoods and around the world. And our mission, compelled by God's mission, is to save the lost and renew all things. We exist to engage more and more people in the Spirit's call to live out God's mission in their neighborhoods and in the world. That's part of what I'm here to do. Encourage us to continue to do what we are in missions, to continue to think about other opportunities that we might have, to think about that imaginatively. Now this morning, <clears throat> the text that I'm using was agreed upon, or we came upon it together as a committee or as a team, the outreach mission team, which is made up of, <clears throat> excuse me, myself, uh, Chris Skevink of, uh, of Canada, uh, Rick, what was <laughs> Rick Nanninga, thank you, Rick Nanninga. Poor Rick, he's going to be upset with me when I tell him, I forgot your last name, Rick. Because we usually talk every, other, every couple of weeks, so I usually just call him Rick. But anyway, Rick Nanaga, who's the chair and my supervisor. Then there is Carla Winham in Truro, uh, a, a member of the Truro Church. There's John Skolman, a member of the Barhaven Church. There is Nick, uh, who's pastor in, in um, Truro as well. And then there's also Aaron Thompson, who's a pastor in Dixon's Corner. So those are the members of the team that I work with, and together we came up with the passage we thought uh, isn't so much necessarily maybe missional, but is meant to be an encouragement to congregations. It's meant to be an encouragement. It's the sermon to the church in Philadelphia that uh, is in Revelations chapter 3. And before I get into that, I'm just going to give you a bit of a background about that passage. Some people have called those uh, seven, seven have called them seven letters to the seven churches, but technically they're not really letters. They're actually sermons, sermons by Jesus to those congregations, to those specific churches. And as I said earlier, he had words of commendation, praise, as well as correction for at least five of the churches. Two of the churches he only had commendation for, Philadelphia and uh, Smyrna. Now, as I said earlier, seven is the number of completion. So, basically, when Jesus has given these seven sermons to the seven churches, he's basically, those sermons were to be read by all the seven churches, and it's a number of completion, which means all churches of all times and all places are to hear those words for themselves to this day, because we're all dealing with the very same challenges that each of those churches were dealing with. Now, in the Greek, in each of those sermons, the word nakao, comes up. The Greek word nakaho is in each of those seven sermons. And it means one who overcomes, one who is victorious, one who will rule. And I think some of us perhaps wear merchandise that's nakao. Basically, it is the brand name Nike. Nike is the English version of nakao. And with its tagline, just do it. So in a sense, we are Nike Christians who just do it in Jesus Christ. We overcome in Christ Jesus. Now, our passage is the Sermon to Philadelphia. Philadelphia means the city of brotherly love. It is present-day Alizir, Turkey, and it was established on a major trade route in about 140 B.C., and that trade route went from east to west and back again, from Asia to Europe, and it was a strategic city economically, militarily, and culturally. It was, in a sense, an open door 
for initially Greek culture and language to go out through the world, and then later on, the Roman, Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, to go out through the world. And now Jesus in Revelations repurposes it for his own mission to the world. And besides being on a major trade route, it was also on a major fault line. So it was rocked regularly by earthquakes. So it suffered damage constantly. And many times, or many of the citizens actually chose to live outside the city walls, which put them at danger from marauders and attack, but it was safer than being in the city, where there's a potential of collapsing buildings. Now, the writer John was exiled on the island of Patmos. He was, in a sense, in his own um, isolation, just like we kind of experienced with COVID, but his was much more severe, and it was because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And while John was writing this, this uh, book of Revelations, he was on the island of Patmos, but at the very beginning, in chapter 1, it says that Jesus stood among the seven lampstands, the seven churches. Jesus was with those seven churches. Though John was not, Jesus was. And as we read this letter to the Philadelphian church, read it knowing that Jesus Christ stands with us today, that he's here with us by the power of the Holy Spirit amidst our own challenges, just as he was with the Philadelphian Christians. To the angel in the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but they are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. And Eugene Peterson, <clears throat> excuse me, in his message, explains it this way. I'll make each conqueror, each overcomer, a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, a permanent position of honor. That's a permanent position of honor. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, <clears throat> excuse me, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from God. And I will also write on them my new name. Basically, we have the identity of Jesus Christ fully on us who believe. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the seven churches. Thus far the reading of God's word at this time. Dan's got you well trained. Awesome. Good job. <clears throat> Friends on a journey of faith, and we're all on that... Uh, journey somewhere along the way, and that journey can take a lot of different ways and a lot of different meandering routes. We're on a journey, whether we are an ardent atheist, whether we're a doubting believer, whether we're just a wandering and wandering seeker, we're all living in response to this God of creation, to his reality, amidst the challenges of our daily lives just as the Philadelphian Christians were doing. Mark Twain, the American author, said, you know, challenges make life interesting. Overcoming them makes life meaningful. Now, you can agree, you can disagree, and you can't, sometimes you may not be so sure, because when you're in the midst of a challenge, 
I'm not so sure that it's always interesting or always that meaningful. Or at the time, we may not always think of it as meaningful or interesting. There is truth in what he says, but sometimes when we're going through a particular challenge, it's not really to afterwards that we appreciate it. And we're confronted by all kinds of challenges in this world. Each and every one of us experience a variety of challenges. And I'm just going to list a whole bunch here. It might be a bit overwhelming, but that's good. It's good to be overwhelmed sometimes. Just kind of imagine what we're facing sometimes. Internationally, we're still dealing with COVID-19. And its variants continue to challenge us and challenge the health system. And then there's the interrelated ones of war and famine and extreme poverty. And the environment, they're all interconnected. And then nationally, we have challenges as a nation. Affordable housing, aging infrastructure, systemic racism, including our relationship between the indigenous and the settler communities. And what about the church worldwide? You know, the past year and a half has been interesting, to say the least, as churches have been challenged to implement COVID protocols that members could accept or if not at least fully agree on, at least accept. And then other churches, even before COVID, were experiencing persecution. They were on the margins of society and of major religions. And denominationally, in the last year, we're starting to wrestle with the report on human sexuality and all its implications. These are challenges, real challenges. And what about as a congregation? What are we dealing with? And... and Every congregation has challenges they're dealing with. You know, some, some members are drifting away during this COVID time. Uh, has the responsibilities that should be really on the larger group fallen to only a few and are only being carried by a few? Are there relational tensions between us? Are there feelings of being left out or that others are just controlling the agenda? And then what about our community around us? Well, there's food, there's building and land. Fuel and housing costs are all rising and continue to rise, and, and working wages often aren't keeping up. And some of them aren't even living wages anymore. And then there's yourself personally. What's your challenge today? What are you facing today personally in your own life? You know, struggling business perhaps, and there's enough of those. My barber, I go to, you know, I <clears throat> talk to my barber regularly, and he in the last year and a half, he might have been open, uh, I'm going to say about 10 months. Uh, 10, months of the, 10 months out of the year, last year and a half, he has been closed. And the other times he has been open. And he has, you know, his, he normally makes about fifty to 60000 a year. I think now he only made about 20000 this year as a barber. So he's affected. So his business is struggling. He's struggling. Perhaps we don't have a job. Perhaps we're struggling with a debt load. Perhaps we have doubt, stress, ill health. We pray for a number of people this morning that are struggling with health, depression, addictions, broken relationships. These are challenges that are very real in each and every one of our lives in some way, shape, or form. And if that's not enough, our passage gives us another challenge to deal with. Our text highlights the fact that in Philadelphia, the Christians were being shunned. And and, and also included some of the other things that I just mentioned too. But at heart, they were being shunned. And we get that from verses 8 and 9 in our passage. Where Christ says, I place an open door before you. The door is wide open to you as Philadelphian Christians. One that no one is going to shut. You know why? Because I, Jesus Christ, have the key, and I keep it open for you. And that recalls Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 20, where Eliakim was King Hilkiah's servant. And he carried just such a key for the palace and for the city. And now Jesus Christ, who is the the king in David's line, holds the key to God's kingdom. A doorway wide open to all those who believe in Philadelphia and by extension to all of us who believe to this day. 
Now, Christ's open door, the fact that Christ is holding this door open, refers to the fact that the door of the synagogue in Philadelphia was closed. It was closed to the Christians. They were left out of worship in the Philadelphian synagogue. And that's why Christ says this of the Philadelphian uh, synagogue, or the leaders there. He says they're of Satan. And Satan is the liar, he is the accuser, and like him, the synagogue leaders were falsely accusing the Christians of not being believers. Falsely accusing them, lying about them, in a sense, and then shutting them out, literally closing them out of worship, where they had worshipped for most of their lives, cutting them off possibly from friends and family who continued to worship there, their familiar place of worship was no longer where they could go anymore. So they had to deal with that shunning, that being left out of the religious community that had been so much a part of their lives up till that time. And besides that religious shunning, they were also shut out economically. Because at that time, uh, trade guilds controlled all the work in uh, Philadelphia and many of the Roman cities. And trade guilds were connected with, oftentimes, a particular god, a patron god of that trade guild. So if you were a Christian, a sincere Christian, you couldn't join these ch- trade guilds because oftentimes they would have uh, celebrations to these gods that would involve worship of these gods. So if you were a sincere Christian, you would not go there. You would not join them. However, in, this, in Jesus' sermons to Pergamum and Thyatira, or excuse me, uh, yeah, Thyatira, uh, Christ actually corrected Christians there for doing just that. They joined trade guilds in order to um, fit in, in order to uh, get ahead, to be part of the economic uh, life of their city so that they could live the good life in a sense. But that meant they also were being faithless to Jesus Christ. And along with all those challenges, along with those two main challenges that they were facing, they also had to deal with what everybody else was dealing with, which was the earthquakes, the natural disaster that constantly happened in their city. So basically, the Philadelphian Christians were facing religious and economic and natural uh, difficulties, natural challenges just like we do today. Just like we do today. They were no different than us. Technologically, maybe, they were behind in some sense from where we are today, but other than that, their challenges aren't that much different from the ones that we face and live with and deal with each and every day of our lives. Yet, yet despite those challenges, they kept his word. They kept his word. They remained faithful. It says that in verse 8. They endured patiently, verse 10. So Christ commends them for their faithfulness. He commends them for the faithfulness because they stuck with him despite the challenges they faced. Now, the word commend is not in our text, it basically means praise, to say something good about another but it describes well what Jesus does here. And I think we're familiar with with, uh, commend or praise where we recognize someone for something they've done, uh, overcoming some challenge through their competence or courage. And oftentimes there's a ceremony with some sort of award or presentation. Uh, Pre-COVID, the United Counties of Leeds and Grenville commended a Taiwanese immigrant Uh, with an entrepreneur award. Because they were recognizing how she, as an immigrant, had overcome the challenges of coming to a new country, learning a new language, a new culture, and the laws that were different here. And all during that, she also was able to establish a business. So she was recognized for her competence and her courage. But biblically, I think we all realize, and the Philadelphian Christians realize too, that no one, that Christians, we don't get ahead by our own competence and our own courage. We don't overcome on our own. 
We don't have the power within us to do that. The Philadelphian Christians did not. Jesus in his sermon recognized that very fact. He said in verse 8, very bluntly, you have little strength. You have little strength. It's an amazing thing to say. You have little strength, but that's okay. We are people of little strength. But you don't have to have a lot of strength. Because I, Jesus Christ, overcome on your behalf. It's through my competence and through my courage that you will overcome if you believe in me. Remain faithful to me in how you live and how you act. Philadelphia was faithful. The Philadelphia Christians were faithful. So what about us here today? How are we Faithful. How are we faithful as Christ's courage and Christ's competence overcomes on our behalf? Amidst all the challenges we face, how are we remaining faithful? That's the question. And we have to admit, we're not doing it perfectly. I'm not doing it perfectly. We have little strength. I have little strength. You know what, though? Christ commends each and every one of us to the extent. He praises us to the extent that we are faithful. Not perfect. It's not about perfection. That's Jesus Christ. He commends us for our faithfulness to him. Faithfulness. That doesn't require perfection. Faithfulness under challenge. And Christ commends you as a congregation. I thank Cole and I thank Pastor Dan for bringing me up to date on some of the things that you do. You know, you've adjusted yourself, as all the churches that I've visited have done so, to COVID-19 restrictions. It hasn't been always easy, and we may not always agree, but we've done so in order to continue to worship and in some way build connection, whether we do that online or whether we do that in person. We continue to meet together. You know, and the online medium has opened up all kinds of possibilities as well, because it draws in people that otherwise may never walk into the doors of a church. So that's an amazing thing that happened, and that happens. Your youth ministries, which have always been a strength, continue to thrive, continue to go on. You're drawing in youth from beyond your own circles. And you continue on with coffee break and next level, ministering to men and women on their faith journey, supporting them on their faith journey. Through Pastor Dan, you're participating in, in trying to set up a, a, develop a website that's going to inform and, and connect people to faith communities here in Athens. You're a member of CAP, Congregation, Congregational Assistance Plan through Shalem Mental Health. So you're supporting people to get the counseling that they need within your own congregation. And you continue to support missionaries like Alice Vanderwerf and the Weavers with Wycliffe. You're doing that as a congregation, joining together with little strength, but together by the power of the Spirit, you are strong. And through all those ways, you are participating with Jesus Christ to overcome challenges that are in this world. Pandemic. The pandemic restrictions with an agreed-upon response so that we can be healthy and well and, and meet together and, and grow in our faith still. You're dealing with the fact that our faith life can get anemic at times. So you have opportunities for people to grow through Bible study and fellowship. You're providing an opportunity for people to connect with Christ through online resources to connect them to a church community in some way, shape, or form. Through missionaries, you are connecting beyond yourself in the world to connect with people abroad. And you're participating in that by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's an amazing thing. And it's no small feat. By participating with Christ and overcoming these things, they're not going to be fully overcome today or tomorrow. 
but they one day will be in the new heaven and the new earth. But we faithfully participate now in the process of getting there. We're participating with Christ. We, we're protecting, we're preserving, we're, we're promoting life spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally. One person said to me, yeah, but you're making missions sound a little too easy. You're kind of letting us off the hook with a minimal amount of effort, and, and, um, and uh, you're not really pushing us very hard on that. And I go, yeah, maybe, but <clears throat> it's not necessarily my job to do. Jesus Christ, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, he's going to push you. He's going to challenge you. He's going to convict you. He's going to move you to get involved He's even going to push you maybe sometimes out of your own comfort zones to do things. That's not my job. That's Christ's job by the power of the Holy Spirit to do in each and every one of your lives. So I know I'm not really making it easy because I recognize that just like in Revelation, Christ corrects, Christ commends, but He also corrects, He challenges, He, he, he forces us to grow, to participate in His mission to the world. And that mission... Uh, for each and every one of us, could be as simple and as hard as just praying for your neighbor by name. That's, that may sound simple, but it can also be hard, because then it means you have to get to know your neighbor a little bit, right? Or you volunteer with a community organization, whether faith-based or secular. Maybe getting outside your comfort zones a little bit. Or sending a card to neighbors that says, hey, I'm here. If you need anything, just call me. Or offering to pick up groceries for those that are shut in, or medicines for those that may be shut in, or have mobility issues, or just befriending a neighbor because they're your neighbor. Not necessarily trying to twist their arm to become Christians, but because you actually sincerely want to get to know them. And through that relationship, maybe build connection. And maybe that will eventually lead to maybe them coming to faith. I don't know. I used to hang out in town here when, I used to, when we lived here. I, and there's two atheist guys I used to hang out with quite a lot. Not because they, I don't know why, we just ended up getting together. And they were a little, little bit rough around the edges maybe, but we kind of liked each other. And I never really converted them, but I didn't go into that, those relationships with the intent to convert them. I went in because, yeah, I kind of like these guys. And yeah, I'm hoping maybe... They will see some of Christ. I don't think either one ever came to Christ. Though one person, one did say to me one time, you know, you know, if I ever do decide to go to church, I think I'll come to your church because I kind of like you. <laughs> so that's a start, right? Isn't that a start? See, missions, missions really in many ways, it's not very exciting if I'm going to be blunt about it. Missions is mundane. Missions is messy. Missions is everyday life. Missions is challenge. It's boring. It's repetitive oftentimes. And it doesn't get, it doesn't get the lamp, it doesn't get the limelight. Interestingly enough, um, you know, earlier on, I said that Jesus calls us lampstands, and if you know anything about lampstands, they're you just they're there, right? And the only time you really notice them is when the light doesn't work. The lampstands are just there; they're functional. They stand there. They're just there, upholding a light that's not their own. That's us. It's not about us. It's about the light, which is Jesus Christ. So our job is kind of mundane, kind of boring, but it is pretty important to be faithfully there, standing there, upholding Christ's light wherever we might be, right here in Athens and beyond. That, that illuminates that open door to an eternal relationship and life with God the Father. That's what we're doing. And through our faithfulness, Christ is going to use that. Our little strength, he's going to use that. He's going to transform people into Nike Christians, overcoming all challenges in him. Just invite us to pray at this time. Jesus, you call us lampstands, and that is what we are. You also call us pillars. And that's what we will be one day. You invite us to uphold your light, to join with you, 
to shine that light out into the world, to be part of your mission to recreate this world in a way that honors and loves God. And if we think about that, wow, that's the amazing scope, the amazing possibilities of that mission are endless and boundless. There's room for all kinds of participation, creativity, expression, whatever our age, whatever our health. It doesn't matter because you can take our little strength and you can do so much with it by the power of the Spirit. Open our eyes, open our hearts to see where you're at work all around us, where we might best fit in in some way, shape, or form. And if we're not sure where we belong, where we fit in, give us the courage to try something, try anything, and try again. You see, the affirmation of our choices, Lord God, is not in human responses or numbers. Because some are going to be planters. Some are going to be people that water. Others will be there at the harvest and see that fruit produced. Yet each person is participating with you in the entire mission. Lord God, Father God, if there are any here among us that are wondering, or wandering, but wondering especially about that open door, wondering about faith, wondering about that eternal relationship with you and what that means, I invite them to consider saying the following prayer. Just think about saying the following prayer. Jesus, I've done so many things wrong. I know you can forgive me. Help my unbelief to become a living faith, serving you as my Lord and Savior. Father, Son, Spirit, disciple us. Disciple each and every one of us. Wherever we are on our faith journey, disciple us. In Jesus' name, amen.